Well, good morning this morning. Morning. The Sunday after Easter. Oh my goodness. What a blessed week last week was. And this week we're having an opportunity to jump back into 1 John. And I hope you brought your Bibles with you this morning or that you have your Bible on on your phone or whatever. Because uh, we're going to be wrapping up 1 John this week and next week. And I am just so excited about the things that I get to share with you this morning. Um, 1 John is a very interesting book. It's one of the most disorganized books in the, in the New Testament. Scholars who study 1 John are, are often frustrated because there's like 20 different ways you can outline 1 John, depending on what you're looking at as your priority or your focus. And uh, John just... Uh, 1 John doesn't really submit to outlining very well at all. And uh, you try different things, and it kind of works, but it kind of doesn't. And one scholar described 1 John as a book that uh, doesn't progress in a straight line from 1, 2, 3, 4. It actually is like a spiral, and it keeps coming around to the same themes. But each time the spiral comes around, it's expanded a little bit, and it's changed a little bit. So you see those same themes from a different perspective, almost like a a piece of art or a piece of classical music that keeps repeating the same themes with a little bit of variation so that you are drawn in deeper and deeper to to the experience as you go through. One of the things I've discovered this time studying 1 John is that the more I read it through, the more it seems to make sense to me. And I'm in like 15 or 16 times now reading through 1 John, and it's beginning to make sense to me. And I'm, I'm just shocked and amazed that this book does that. One of the things that I discovered as I've read through is that almost every sentence in this book is linked to some other part of the New Testament. Like you can literally read a sentence and then ask yourself, well, where, where's that sentence? Oh, that's in Ephesians. Oh, that's in 1 Corinthians. Oh, that's in Colossians. It's like the book of 1 John is designed to bring all of the truth of God's Word and and our relationship with Jesus and and understanding about faith. It it brings all these things into one place, (laughs) and it's just amazing. So I'm going to start off here with um, chapter 5, verse 13. So if you have your Bibles, you're going to want to turn to that because... John tells us why he wrote this book, why he wrote this book. In chapter 5, verse 13, and I know I'm skipping ahead because this last chapter 4 and chapter 5 are kind of part of a a closing spiral. It's the big spiral. And uh, we'll see some things there that are familiar. We'll see some things there that are new. We'll see some things there that we probably need to focus on applying in our own individual lives. But verse 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Wow. That's pretty cool. (laughs) Well, John is writing to us who believe in the name of the Son of God. So this proves that 1 John is a book that's written to believers. It's not an evangelistic book. It's a book that's written to believers to help us understand how to live our lives more effectively. And it's written to people who believe in the name of the Son of God. And we've talked about that. You'll see that in passages all over the New Testament. The Gospels, Acts, the letters to the epistles. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, What, is it, what does it mean to believe on the name of the Son of God? And notice that John specifically doesn't use that name. He refers to that name. So it's almost as if he's inviting us to answer the question, what name is, what, what name is John talking about? Well, he's talking about the name that Jesus used, Son of God, which is a very new perspective. It's, it would include his name as Son of Man, which was a reference to his role as Messiah. Or you could take the name that we often use, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that word Lord is the, the Greek word Adonai. It's the, the word that the Jewish people would often use when they read the name of Jehovah in the Old Testament because they didn't want to violate the, the command not to take the name of the Lord in vain. They would choose not to pronounce the name of the Lord. They would, they would not say, you know, Yahweh or Jehovah or those Old Testament names of God. They would insert the Greek name Adonai, which means Lord or Master. So when we call the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're actually using the word that means the Old Testament God. So when we say, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're actually saying, well, I'm writing this book to people who believe that Jesus is the representative of the Old Testament God that we know as Yahweh or Jehovah. He is the son of Yahweh, Jehovah. He is Yahweh, Jehovah. And then he's Jesus. His name says Jesus, and we know what that means because when the angel told Mary, you know, that's what I want you to name your son um, because he is going to save his people from their sins. Jesus is like James. It's a derivative of Jacob, and it refers to the idea that God saves. And then Christ is the Greek word for the anointed, the chosen, and it reflects the idea of the Hebrew word Messiah, which is also a word in Hebrew that means anointed or chosen. And so we're looking at this name of the Lord Jesus Christ saying, oh, he is God's representative, he is our Savior, and he is the one who is chosen to rule over the earth into eternity. And so I am just, it's, it's exciting to see that John draws our attention into this question with this strange phrase, you know, by identifying us as believers in the name of the Son of God. What name are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the name that defines who Jesus is. And so I love that. And then, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So that you may know that you have eternal life. Well, I enjoy understanding John's purpose but if he's writing to me so that I may know that I have eternal life, it means that he's writing to people who believe in Jesus that aren't sure that they have eternal life. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> That's part of the deal. John 3, 16. You know, if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we, we won't perish, but we'll have, ever, we'll have eternal life. But John is writing this book because... Many of the Christians that he was writing to, the Christians that he lived with, the Christians that he was ministering to in Ephesus and the cities around where he was the pastor or bishop in Asia Minor, many of those people were Christians, but they didn't understand that they had eternal life. They weren't confident about that. They didn't really believe it. They didn't understand what it means. And so John is writing this book so that Christians would really be able to understand God's eternal plan and purpose for their lives. Oh my goodness, that puts our life in a very different perspective. It also helps us to understand that there is a danger of trying to live the Christian life without being able to really understand God's long-term purpose for us. And that he has a long-term purpose for us. That he is building in our life experiences the ability to love him and to trust him no matter what happens, no matter what comes our way. And we'll see how John develops that in chapter 4 and chapter 5. <clears throat> now the big picture of this last spiral in 1 John. It begins with this declaration that believers have the Holy Spirit in their lives. If you go back to chapter 3, the end of chapter 3, there is this declaration that God's Holy Spirit lives in the lives of Christians. But one of my favorite stories of the Old Testament is the story of Samson. I love that Old Testament Superman hero character. He just uh, makes me feel like, you know, God can deal with whatever comes in my life. If God wants to give me the strength and power to deal with this challenge, he can. Or if he wants me to just suffer through it, then that's okay too, because I know I can trust God. But one of the things about the Samson story that has always bothered me is the idea that when Samson finally goes into Delilah and then he's sleeping and, and the Philistine soldiers come in and they cut off his hair and he jumps up and the, and the story, the, the Bible actually says, and he did not know that the Spirit of God had left him. And so he tries to fight the Philistines not knowing 
that he had lost this power that came from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Like he didn't feel that the Holy Spirit was missing in his life. I've always wondered, why in the world would that little detail be part of the story? Well, now, as I've studied the New Testament, I've come to understand that one of the reasons that Samson's story tells us he didn't feel the Holy Spirit missing was because the Holy Spirit isn't something that we can feel like in a, a sensory way in our lives. That he lives in our lives, but we can't feel him. We don't experience this feeling. We, we have to accept the promise of God that the Holy Spirit lives within us and then move forward in faith that that truth is a reality. And this passage that John, 1 John gives us declares that the Holy Spirit lives in the lives of everybody who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're a believer in Jesus, the Bible says the Holy Spirit lives in you. And it, it, it does something specific. But now in chapter 4, as we move into the beginning of chapter 4, one of the things we're going to notice is that, that, that John is helping us to understand how to understand and how to deal with this issue of the Holy Spirit of God living in our hearts and in our lives, in our minds. So let's begin with verse 1 of chapter 4, 1 John, chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, this simple statement kind of blows up many ideas about spirituality. I watch people on television sometimes, and they'll say, oh, I'm very spiritual. Um, I'm thinking... Well, what does that mean? Does that mean you're a Christian? Or does that mean you're, you're something else that has connectin, connection with a spirit world? Or some people define spirituality as just being a person who is connected to a community of other people that uh, they enjoy the company of. Spiritual, you know, well, what does it mean? Well, John is helping us understand that spiritual actually means being connected to the Spirit of God. And this passage is a fascinating passage. Why would John tell us that we need to test the spirits to see if they are of God? Which spirits does he say we should test? <laughs> what does the passage say? It says every spirit. So this passage is inviting us. It's the Apostle John inviting us as Christians to be a little skeptical. Not to be gullible. Not to just swallow everything that everybody tells you. Not to think that faith is a positive attitude towards everything that gets preached out there. No, he's telling us as Christians, be skeptical. Test every spirit. Now, in the Greek culture, this idea of spirit was used to describe the gods of the Greek pantheon. And there were a lot of gods in the Greek pantheon, and those gods were referred to as spirits. They didn't have physical bodies, they were spirits. And they were activated or motivated by spiritual influences. And so I could just run down the Greek pantheon. Oh, hundreds of gods. You know, my favorites would be... Um, oh, Hercules. Superman, kind of a Samson character. Yep. And this girl named Aphrodite, or Venus, who was a beautiful girl, came up out of the waves in the ocean, and she was the goddess of romance. Like, yay, that's cool. <laughs> and uh, there, were, there was this god, um, Poseidon, who was in charge of the oceans. And every time I go out sailing, I think of Poseidon and uh, what he might do to me if I get too far off the coast or if I let the wind get too strong or, or whatever. And the Greeks, they would make offerings to all these different gods. If they were going sailing, they would make an offering to Poseidon at the Poseidon Temple. If they were, giving, uh, if they were getting ready to have a baby, they would go down to the, to the goddess of, of childbirth, Diana or Artemis, and they would offer a sacrifice there at the temple. And uh, all of those gods were controlled by the most powerful god in Greek, the Greek pantheon, and his name was Zeus. You know, so there's this this spirits of the pantheon. And since John is writing in the Greek culture in the first century, I think that what he's doing is he's using this, this instruction, test every spirit to see if they are of God, 
as a way of embracing the pagan people who had become part of the church of Jesus Christ. And he's basically telling them, be skeptical. Don't believe everything that you're taught. Don't believe that everything that some prophet or some preacher teaches. Because there are many false prophets in the world. And that's what John tells us. There are many false prophets in the world. <clears throat> now, let's see. Many false prophets who've gone out into the world. Let's pick up verse 2. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. So he's giving them a standard by which they can know the difference between spirits from God and spirits that are not from God. <clears throat> Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Wow, that is pretty simple, pretty clear. But every spirit that does not acknowledge that Jesus is not from God, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. So John didn't give a list of standards, or religious um, standards, you know, here's the, the ten things that you've got to believe if you're a Christian. No, he narrows it down to one thing. What do you believe about Jesus? Is he the Son of God? Is he driven by the Spirit of God? Is he the one that you've put your faith and trust in as a Christian? <laughs> well, any spirit that says Jesus has come in the flesh, that's on God. That's the Spirit on God's side. Now, what's so weird about this? Well, what's so weird about it is that in the Greek culture, these spirits or gods were not flesh. They were spirits. They were ideals. They were ideas. They, were, they represented values and they weren't physical beings because in the Greek culture, what was physical was evil. <laughs> what was spiritual was the ideal. It was pure. It was holy. And so in the Greek mind, God could never become a man because there's no way that a pure God would enter into the physical world and experience the things that we experience. And yet this is the very thing that Paul says, hey, <laughs> when people say that Jesus came in the flesh that he lived among us as a human being, that he took on physical reality. <laughs> those are the guys that, that are preaching God's word because those are the guys who know what God has done. Because Greeks would never, ever think that God would become a man. This was like the impossible test. And so theologically, for the, for the Christians in the first century... John focuses on this and says, hey, this is how you can tell the difference between the Spirit of God and all these other guys out there. Oh, my goodness. It's a dramatic test. It's an amazing test. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Now, John knows that he's preaching to a, a, a group of people who have come out of a culture where they believed in many, many, many gods. <laughs> and you notice that John doesn't do a little section on comparative religion here. And I would love to spend some time with you doing comparative religion this morning. Because we live in a world where there are many, 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 many different ways of looking at the reality that we experience as people. But I'm not going to do comparative <laughs> religions this morning. I'm going to tell you that if you want to do a little comparative study, it would, be, it would help your faith. It would strengthen your faith. It would give you a solid foundation. Go home and look up on Wikipedia. You know, what do Hindus believe? 250 million gods, all accountable to Brahma. It almost sounds like a little bit like the Greek pantheon. Or you could look up Buddhism, which doesn't believe in any gods. It just believes in a universe, which is divine. And if we meditate and we do certain things, then we can eliminate the illusions of our life and become one with the divine. <laughs> like, okay, that's interesting. You could look up Mormonism. You could look up all different kinds of things that are outside the fringes of Christianity, and you would discover something. They all teach and believe things that are very, very different. But one of the things that we all share is probably the opportunity at one point or another in the last few years to have heard the story about the elephant and the six blind men who try and uh, decide what the elephant is. Anybody heard that story? No? 
Well, it's often used in books that are designed to discredit Christianity. It was included in the God Delusion book that I read several years ago on a missions trip to Haiti. I saw it in the airport and I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this book and see what it says. And uh, I'm going to figure out how to argue against it, you know. Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion. Well, in that book, he echoes, along with many other people, that this story about religions. He says, religion is like six blind men who encounter an elephant. And one blind man touches the ear and, and decides that, that, that religion, that his religion is like a fan. <laughs> And another blind man touches the side of the elephant, and he decides that his religion is like a wall. Another blind man touches the tail of the elephant and decides that his religion is like a rope. Well, if you go through these six blind men, then the narrator comes into the story and says that all religions have a kernel of truth, okay? But that none of them absolutely understand what is the truth because they're blind and then the narrator begins to explain that the, the problem is that they can't see the whole elephant. They're only touching part of it. And we know that an elephant has an ear, has a tail, has legs, has a side. And that if you only experience the pieces, you don't get the big picture. You see how foolish religion is? Because it only gives you a part of the picture. What you don't understand, unless you're a thinking person... The narrator has taken off his blindfold and, and he has asserted the claim that, that he can see the big picture and that the religions of the world can't see the big picture. They only see part of the picture. <laughs> oh my goodness. And he's kind of suckered in the, the listeners because we can remember what an elephant looks like. And when he, when he tells us this story, we immediately realize, oh, I know what an elephant looks like. <laughs> And so these blind guys, they only saw part of the picture. Yeah, oh, that's, that's so right. Oh my goodness, what a truth. <laughs> the problem is, truth is not an elephant. And somebody needs to ask the narrator, well, what exactly do you mean, what is the bigger truth that all religions see a part of? Isn't that interesting? Because when you agree with the story, you don't realize it, but you're buying into a whole bunch of little ideas. That there is a truth that religions all share. Well, spend a few minutes in Wikipedia and you'll discover that that is not true. <laughs> all religions don't share the same truth. If you buy into that story... One of the things that's implied in that story is that none of the religions see the full picture. Oh my goodness, where did that come from? So this story about the elephant, in, in, in essence, discredits all religions. <laughs> and as you read the story and you buy into that idea, you're not realizing that you're, you're being influenced by something that you're not understanding. And one of the things Christians need to ask as they, as they test the spirits is, is where did you get that idea? No, actually, no. The first thing you need to ask is, what exactly do you mean? <laughs> yeah, what is the elephant you're talking about? You know, clarify this for me. What exactly is the elephant? What is the overall truth that some religions have a part of, but that none of them actually do understand? Oh, you don't, you can't explain that. Well, can you explain why you were asserting that none of the religions who have little parts of the truth actually are true? Because that's one of the other implications of this story, that religions are not true. Now, logically, if, you're a, if you understand logic or remember logic, one of the things in logic is the law of non-contradiction. If you have A and B and A and B are different, then A and B are not equal. If A and B are equal, then A and B are not different. That's logic. It's basic logic. It's the idea that two things that say opposite stuff can't both be true. Only one of them can be true. And so this story about the elephant is a very interesting story because it's, it's illogical. 
it suggests that all religions are equal because they all have a part of the truth. Okay, but that's not logical. They can't all be true. In logic, there's only two options. One is that they all have to be false, which is the implication of this elephant story. They actually are all false. Religions are all false. <laughs> and so what is the, the big elephant? What is the big truth that the religions all see a part of? It's the truth that there is no God. <laughs> and that's why atheists use this story in their lectures to convince Christians and other people that there really is no God. There really is no true perspective. There is only a perspective that, that is out there independently on our own, trying to live our lives without listening to anybody else. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So the first option is that none of them are true. <laughs> the second option is that only one of them can be true. If you have six different things and they say different things, then they're all false or one of them is true. But the idea that all of them can be true is ridiculous. It's not logical. It's not scientific. A philosopher wouldn't buy into or get caught in that trap. And the people that use that illustration are people that are trying to deceive and manipulate others because of their ignorance, because, of, because they're not schooled in logic and philosophy. It's a, they're taking an advantage over us and trying to manipulate us. And so when John brings up this issue in 1 John, what is he saying? He's saying there's only one true way. There's only one way that represents God, and it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. It it's kind of reminds me of what he told Mary and Martha in John 11. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Oh, my goodness. And the faith that we hold together as Christians, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, it means that we have to choose. We have to choose this one way to approach God. Because that's what the Bible says. It doesn't leave us other options. And I've talked about this before. Jesus is not a great prophet. <laughs> Jesus is not a great teacher. Jesus is not a great miracle worker. No, Jesus is the Son of God. And He is the only way that we can ever approach God the Father. Is in a relationship with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John is reinforcing this. In this passage, he's basically saying, yeah, there's all kinds of spirits out there, but the only one that you want to listen to is the spirit that preaches and teaches who Jesus is, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead here because I don't want to wear you out. Verse 4. <laughs> you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Who's them? All of the other priests teaching all of the other stuff that isn't focused on Jesus Christ. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Wow. A few years ago, we were in um, Haiti with uh, some of you who are actually here today. And we heard the testimony of a young man named Nelson who had been a, a, a witch doctor. He had been a voodoo witch doctor. And he had told the story of how these people from the church there where we were ministering had come to his home and they tried to give him a Bible and he cursed at them and he sent them away and he prayed curses over them and, and literally prayed that the, the demons that he worshipped would destroy these Christian missionaries. <laughs> well, a couple of days they came back to give him a Bible and to pray with him. And he got really angry and he was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. I'm going to teach them. And so he drove him off the property, and, and uh, he made some offerings and some sacrifices, and he did some deeper voodoo magic, and he pronounced curses on those missionaries. And he was like, ah, I was certain that the things I had done were going were gonna to just destroy them. And I was going to find out in a couple of days that these people were dead or sick or, you know, something terrible. And he waited, and a couple of days later, those missionaries came back and tried to give him a Bible and witness to it. And he was so floored that it, it, he was so shaken that what he said when he shared his testimony was that he was familiar with powerful spirits and that he had called down powerful spirits against these missionaries. And if they were coming back the third day to give him a Bible and pray with him, that their spirits were more powerful than his spirits and he wanted their spirits because 
he knew that their spirits were more powerful than the voodoo gods that he was worshiping. And I loved hearing that testimony. It was such an encouragement to us as we sat there in that group and we heard him share because he was sharing some things that you could see were deeply part of his experience emotionally and personally. Oh my goodness, he was affected by this, that he had prayed that they would be cast away and cursed and they came back the third day happy as they could be to share the Bible with him. And I just think about this verse, what John is saying, and it reminds me of that testimony from that voodoo priest. Oh my goodness, the Spirit of God is more powerful than the spirits that you are trying to figure out if they're God's spirits or not God's spirit. You don't have to worry. You have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in them. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Now, John is taking a huge course in philosophy and, and, and bringing it back to one simple paragraph. He's saying the only guys who have the true scoop are the guys that are preaching the word of God. Because it's God's word. And God has given us the true scoop. And so if you want to be right, if you want to have the right answer, this is where you're going to be. And notice in that paragraph, he gives us a couple of things to use in our discerning about the spirits. He says that the, the people who, who come in the spirit of God, they listen to us. Who's he talking about? He's talking about himself and the other apostles who have told and written and preached the story of Jesus. He's saying the people that are coming to listen to us, these are God's people. And the people who come and don't stay, they don't listen, they don't cooperate, they don't repeat the story, they don't buy into the story, those people are not God's people. Now, this is an amazing truth. It's so simple, it's so concise, that it's difficult to process. Oh my goodness, how can it be that simple? And what happens with Christians that buy into this approach is that they often wind up like the Pharisees. They wind up legalistic and judgmental, and here's the standards, and here's what you have to do, and what you have to say in order to be a Christian. When you take this particular approach, my job is to discern the difference between the spirits of God and the spirits of the world. There is this, this thing that happens to us that kind of tends to make us legalistic, judgmental. And we wind up pointing our finger at people that don't comply with our idea of what a godly Christian should be and condemning them. And I think that's why John moves directly from this first little paragraph about it's our responsibility as Christians to test the spirits. It's our responsibility as Christians to decide who's from God and who isn't from God. And then what he does is he immediately launches into a new value that's part of this testing process. And you'll see what it is as we begin to read uh, verse 7, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. <laughs> oh my goodness, he just built a really strong foundation for lots of judgment and lots of finger pointing and lots of feeling superior to other people. And then he goes to this love value. Oh my goodness, and what does he do with this love value? He says, dear friends. Oh no, where am I? Verse 7, dear friends. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now see what John has done here? He's again drawing the line. He's saying there's a, there's a good group and there's a bad group. But these groups are defined by love. So there's confusion all of a sudden. Who am I supposed to love? Well, we know from reading through the scriptures in the New Testament, we're supposed to love our neighbors, we're supposed to love our wives and our family, we're supposed to love our friends, we're supposed to love other Christians, and we're supposed to love our enemies. You see, love doesn't separate between the good and the evil. Love says, oh no, <laughs> if you love, then you know God. Why? Because God is love. As we read through the following verses, we'll see that. Before we go there, I want to remind you about love. What kind of love is this? Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. You know. Oh, I love your shirt, Danny. Thanks. Hey, you're welcome. 
blue. Like it, like it. Hope, I love your dress. That's great. Is that what this verse is talking about? No. 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 There's seven words in the Greek language that refer to where they get translated love in the English language. Our language is not very specific. The four words that were most common in Greek be, um, are fairly simple to understand. They give us a good range. Three of those words are used in the Bible. and The, the first one I'm going to talk about, storge, is not used in the Bible. It's just a common Greek word for the idea of love focused in a family. I love my wife. I love my kids. Is that what this verse is talking about? No. The next Greek word is the word eros, from where we get the Greek, the, um, the English word erotic. It's the love of romance. It's the love that uh, men and women and boys and girls have. And I uh, wonder if this is the love that God's talking about. <coughs> nope. John is not saying, have you ever been in love with someone? <laughs> that's evidence that you're from God. No, that's not what he's saying. There's another Greek word called philos or phileo. And it's the, the word we get Philadelphia from. It's the idea of brotherly love or companion love. It's the love that soldiers have when they go to the battlefield and they shoot enemies and that they, they, uh, they have a, a common experience, the love of brotherhood. That's not the love that we're talking about here. The word in this passage is the word agape. And it's a description of the unconditional love of God. It's sacrificial. This kind of love says there is nothing that I will not give to help you. I will die to help you. And this love doesn't expect anything in return. I'm going to love you, and you don't have to make my bed. You don't have to clean my house. You don't have to give me money. You don't have to support me when I'm sick. I'm going to love you, and I do not expect anything in return. That's what this kind of love is, agape. And it's interesting because this agape word is used 45 times in the five chapters of the book of 1 John. It's almost as if this is the key word for the book of 1 John. It's almost like this is what John really wants us to understand. Love. How does it work? Oh, my goodness. Verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Oh, whoa. He's like, okay, here's the deal. Love. Love is what God does. Are you loving? Then maybe you know God. Then he gives us an example of what, he, what kind of love he's talking about. And the, what's the example he gives us? It's the Easter example. Jesus hanging on the cross. I love you. And I'm paying for your sins. And you don't have to love me back. You don't have to pay me back. You don't even have to respond I am still going to give everything that I am for you. That's love. Now, this is a kind of love that we can only understand in our relationship with the Lord and in our relationship with Jesus. If we want to love the people around us, then that's the kind of love we have to have. Now, ever since I preached on loving our enemies about a month ago, I've been trying to love my enemies. Everybody who cuts me off on the freeway, instead of honking my horn and giving them symbols of my affection, I uh, pray that God will let me love them. <laughs> Dear Lord, help me to love that person. Keep them safe and help them get where they're going. They're obviously in a hurry and maybe they're late. And Lord, just look over them and bless them in their day. Now, let's see. Dear friends, verse 11. Since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So the way Jesus loved us is the way we should love other people. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So what John is saying here in this little sentence is complicated. If we claim to have a relationship with God, then his love should be working out of our lives in certain circumstances. Now, maybe not all of them. Maybe you're not loving everybody. Maybe you're still pretty upset and kind of angry at that person at work that keeps calling you names or whatever the, the, your problem is, you know. This isn't saying you have to love everybody and you have to be perfect. This is saying that the way we see God at work in our lives is through this expression of love that only comes from Him. 
Whoa. So remember, chapter 5, 13, I'm writing these things so that you will know that you have eternal life. And so what is one of the ways that we know that we have eternal life? Well, we can tell the difference between God's spirit and other spirits. The second thing is that we can see this agape, this sacrificial love coming out of our, coming out of our life. Not because it's our idea, but because God is living in us. So one of the things that provides us with assurance as Christians is that we see God's love coming out of us in the strangest ways. Loving people who have decided to be our enemy or to have decided to be our judge or our critic or our competition. And so this is an amazing thing, that love would be a part of this dynamic. I love the fact that it's not theology. <laughs> I can talk to Calvinists, and I can talk to Arminian uh, theologians, and I can find um, things that we share in common because we, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't have to argue with those people. I don't have to be angry with those people. I can love them because they love Jesus. Now, the next few little passage, John moves into kind of a repeat that's part of the spiral. Notice it as we read through. He's re-summarizing or restating these truths in a little bit more concise fashion so we can see that they're not separate truths. They're truths that fit together. This is how we know that we live in him and that he in us, he has given us his spirit. Oh my goodness. And we discover the spirit. How? By understanding that the spirit motivates us to understand and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Okay, so that's the definition of who Jesus is. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. <laughs> is that amazing? So testing the spirits and experiencing God's love is a part of being confident about our relationship with God. That next, the next part of that verse, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and, in, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we have confidence in the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. It can be little teeny, it can be big huge, but love defeats fear. And one of the things that we should recognize in our life when we're afraid is that we're probably not loving the things that God wants us to love. If we're afraid of being obedient to God's word, then what do we need to do? We need to love God. We need to love Jesus because he died on the cross for me. There was nothing he was not willing to do to save me. Oh my goodness, love conquers fear, which is a huge, huge thing. It's a principle that every Christian should understand. How do you get over fear? Love. Love is the thing that conquers fear in our lives. Are you afraid of failing, afraid of business loss, afraid of financial loss, whatever you're afraid of? The Bible says that love is the solution. Use that money to help people who are in need. You know, use your academic success to help people that are in need. Find a way to use the things that God is doing in your life to help the people that you need to be loving. And so I love this passage. We love because he first loved us, verse 19. Verse 20, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. <laughs> now again, John starts this book with darkness and light, the opposites. He's drawing a line in the sand between two extremes. Is the spirit of God or is the spirit other? And now he's coming down to love and he's doing that same thing with love. He's basically drawing a line and he's saying, if you love people, then you know God. If you don't love people, then you don't know God. It's that's just that simple. And don't get carried away. It's not about who you need to love. That's what religion does. It decides who's on the side of love that you need to do. Oh, yeah, you need to love your brothers. And you can probably think of religious expressions where that idea is communicated. We're taught to love our brothers, but the people who don't believe like us, they're our enemies, and we can, we can take them on. We don't have to love them. That is not Christianity. That is not what God's word says. <clears throat> For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. 
And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. What an amazing way to talk about one of the things that helps us to know that we are children of God is our ability to love other people the way God wants us to. Oh, my goodness. That's going to change the way I treat my family this afternoon. It's going to change the way I treat my co-workers tomorrow. It's going to change the way I treat the people at the grocery store on Wednesday. Because I'm a Christian. God lives in me and his love is willing to come out through me. All I have to do is open the door. All I have to decide is I am going to express God's love so that other people will know that God exists and they can see that in my life because of my love. <laughs> wow. So what does a Christian look like? Well, a Christian looks like somebody who loves people that aren't lovable. A Christian looks like people that put their fear in perspective using the love of God to move through difficult situations even though they may not want to. Oh my goodness, the beginning. Now chapter 5, we're going to talk about faith. These are the three things that Paul uses. He says, hey, here's the key to knowing who the Spirit of God is and who the other spirits are. And here's one of the ways you can know that God lives in your life because of love. And then the last thing he talks to as he's doing this spiral is he's saying faith, faith. And chapter 5 is going to walk us through this process of understanding how our faith gives us confidence in eternal life and how our faith gives us strength spiritually to face the challenges that God has in our path. And this is uh, John's method, his uh, three little things. And uh, I love that. One of the things that uh, John has in 1 John is a bunch of triplets. You know, there's the traps, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. <laughs> And then there's the three cures, confession, forgiveness, and cleansing. There's the three persons of the, Holy, of, the, of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And as we're going through 1 John, he keeps coming around in these threes. He keeps repeating some of these things in a little bit deeper level, a little bit deeper perspective so that we can understand them. And I would in encourage you this afternoon, read this part of chapter 4 again and ask yourself, who am I loving? Who am I supposed to love that I'm not loving? And how does my attitude towards these other people change the way people see me and the way people see God? And we're headed into a pretty exciting time in the United States. We've got an election coming up in a few months. We've got some political decisions that are likely to be made in the next couple of months, getting ready for the election. There's going to be a sense in which I think our world is going to try and draw us into that argument. And I want to encourage you as Christians, who are you supposed to love? Well... We're supposed to love everybody that God brings into our lives. And so I'm praying for the health of people in leadership in Washington, D.C. I'm praying for wisdom. I'm praying for the, that they will understand the truth, that God will, that God will bring people into their life that can share the love of Christ with them. And uh, I'm praying for our country, that God will give us wisdom as a country, that we will stand up for what's right and reject what's wrong.